We'll, by the way, we'll do questions uh, for the panel at the conclusion of all the presentations. Marla Lewis will be our next speaker. Um, I've known Dr. Lewis for many, many uh, years, and uh, he and I actually, I think, were in preschool together. <laughs> no. But he is at the uh, Competitive Enterprise Institute and, of course, uh, writes extensively on uh, climate change, but also uh, served for a period of time in the Congress as a uh, as a uh, chief of staff and, and as a result has a very good understanding of the political ramifications, not just simply the, uh, the science side of things. So please welcome Marla Lewis. Thank you very much, George. It's uh, really a, a pleasure to, to be on this panel with you and your memory must be better than mine, but <laughs> I don't require, I don't, in fact, I think I never was in preschool, but uh, anyway, I, I think uh, also, Michael, I, I couldn't agree with, with, your, with you more, and especially that last concluding point, that, that uh, the power to ration and control energy is too great a power to entrust into the hands of any government. I think that's probably where I, that was my starting point in becoming concerned about uh, global warming. Well, uh, I'm going to be speaking to today about the what I would call the litigation threat uh, in, in the great global warming debate. And uh, you, as you can see from the title of my presentation, Will Litigants and Courts Enact Two, Three, Many Kyotos? Uh, some of you who uh, earned their political stripes in the, uh, during the, the wild and woolly 60s will remember that uh, that was a phrase that I have stolen here from Che Guevara who said that uh, the great revolutionary movement would confront the United States with two, three, many Vietnams. Um, <clears throat> here's a, just a brief outline of what I'm going to cover. And uh, I'm going to just start by just pointing out that cap and trade is not the only game in town. Uh, we have to win this battle. We, we can't let them enact cap and trade bills. But even if we succeed, uh, we can't, we can't uh, just uh, go home and enjoy uh, a, a long vacation because they're at it on many fronts, and uh, uh, one of them is, uh, is is what I would call the, the litigation <clears throat> agenda, and it itself is uh, has has multiple theaters in this battle, as as you can see. I, they're, they're litigating to regulate carbon dioxide under common law, federal common law, um, under, the, under NEPA, the, the, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act. Uh, re recently, I just found out the Clean Water Act and especially the Clean Air Act. This, I'm not going to go through these, but these are just some of the cases, only some, this is not complete, of the, of the, the attempts to regulate carbon dioxide via a Clean Air Act litigation. Um, there, there, there are other cases. Uh, there's this <laughs> attempt recently by a, a native village in Alaska to uh, uh, to sue Exxon Mobil, BP. They finally got what they deserve. Uh, a whole bunch, a whole bunch of every, basically every major emitter company in the United States has been named in this lawsuit. It's a federal common law lawsuit. This was the one that I, I just found about in, in preparing for this, uh, this talk, uh, a petition uh, to, uh, to compel the Environmental Protection Agency to set new pH water quality standards on the grounds that carbon dioxide emissions are acidifying the ocean. And so what they hope is that there will be some kind of water quality standard adopted under the Clean Water Act, which will compel uh, EPA and other agencies to control CO2 emissions from power plants and who knows, maybe from automobiles. Um, uh, there, there's also others that are in development that haven't, uh, that haven't actually been filed. Um, then there's the polar bear listing, which apparently is, well, according to some rumors, is imminent. According to others, it's still months off. Um, but uh, this, this, I think, is, is really interesting. Uh, I have two quotes here from an article by uh, Brendan Cummings and Cassie Siegel of the Center for Biological Diversity. These are the folks who petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Service to list the polar bear as a threatened species, the argument being that global warming is going to melt away the polar bear's habitat and therefore, in time, make the polar bears go extinct, even though we know uh, 
that there have been previous periods like the Holocene climate optimum and the last interglacial, which were much warmer than anything we're experiencing now. Uh, and the polar bears seem to have come through that OK. But they, uh, they explain what their strategy is. They say uh, whether greenhouse gas emissions can be halted to protect polar bears will be a test of the statutes, the Endangered Species Act's continuing relevance in the 21st century. So in their, in their mind, listing the polar bear will have been for naught uh, un, will have been for naught unless it results in mandates to control greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, I think, you know, this is, this is perfectly logical what they say next. There is no reason that greenhouse gas emissions, which jeopardize polar bears, assuming you, you accept that, should be treated any differently than pesticides that harm salmon or logging that harms owls. So that is their, that is their goal. They've, they've stated it in print. Uh, they've had similar statements on their website, which they have uh, recently removed. But that's the goal of listing the polar bear. It's basically to Kyotoize America. Um, and now we come to, I think, uh, w uh, the most imminent of these litigation threats. This is the specter haunting the United States economy uh, ever since uh, the, the court case of Massachusetts versus EPA. And uh, Ian Murray, I'm sure, recognizes that image of the specter. Ian is one of my colleagues. We share a deep love of comic books because, see, in comic books, there is good and evil, and there are heroes and villains, um, something I can get my mind around. Uh, and but th this, does anyone recognize the image on the right, this courtroom scene? Does anyone remember what that's from? Well, that's from the Three Stooges movie called Disorder in the Court. And unfortunately, that's what we got in Massachusetts versus EPA. Now, I, I don't want to work through the whole chronology of that uh, because we, we don't have time. But basically, what happened is that there was an, a collection of environmental groups. They petitioned EPA to regulate carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from new motor vehicles way back in October 1999. The Clinton administration did nothing in response to this petition until it was about to leave office. Uh, so it, right in January of 2001, they, they uh, put out a request for information to the public. What should we do about this petition? And then the Bush administration in August uh, 2003 denied the petition. Then the, many of the same environmental groups joined by 12 state attorneys general who just had nothing better to do. Uh, uh, you know, there are not enough criminals for them to prosecute, so they had to get involved in this. Uh, so they filed a suit. It went to the D.C. Uh, District uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, the Court of Appeals upheld EPA's denial uh, of the uh, petition to regulate these emissions from motor vehicles. Uh, but then uh, that was appealed, went to the Supreme Court, and then by five to four, the Supreme Court overturned the uh, D.C. Court's decision. And it found that a carbon dioxide is a, an air pollutant under the Clean Air Act. I don't, I don't believe that was a correct reading of the act, but we can get into that later. And they said that EPA had to determine whether greenhouse gas emissions from new motor vehicles endanger public health and welfare, or, uh, or, if, or explain why the science is too uncertain for, for them to make such a determination. And that whatever EPA does or doesn't do, it has to ground its action or inaction in the statute. So, and since then, see, here's, here's something. Their carelessness can, can be fatal in politics. Uh, the, the Bush administration, um, there was, I don't know, there were some clever people, or they thought they were clever. Uh, and they said, OK, well, we'll make an endangerment finding. We'll find that CO2 emissions endanger public health and welfare. And that'll be a twofer. Uh, just think of that. We, we, can, we can respond to the court, which we have to do at some point, but we can also trigger statutory authority under the Clean Air Act for the President's 20 and in 10 initiative. Now, what's that? That was this silly idea that the Bush administration had, that we're going to get 20 percent of the nation's motor fuels uh, from, from, from biofuel sources in 10 years. Uh, so this is ethanolism. You know, this is part of the addiction that that is uh, swept over Washington, and uh, and then 
uh, because they thought they realized they didn't have authority, existing statutory authority, to do that. But they thought if we get an endangerment finding, we can do this under the Clean Air Act. And then Congress passed this energy bill in December, and the President Bush signed it, which. Uh, which gave the president all the authority he would ever need to implement 20 and 10. In fact, it told him to go do it. Um, <clears throat> and so they didn't really need an endangerment finding. And then a bunch of people started warning them, the Chamber of Commerce and about 18 other business associations and uh, the, the, the Competitive Enterprise Institute and it, many of its good friends, including uh, Frontiers of Freedom here, we started to warn the Bush administration that you are, a, you are about to create a Pandora's box. Stop. Um, here's what happens if the, if the Environmental Protection Agency determines that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions from new motor vehicles endanger public health and welfare. It, the first thing that happens is it makes carbon dioxide, for the first time, a regulated pollutant a pollutant subject to regulation, that's the, that's the official phrase, under the Clean Air Act. And so EPA would not only have to regulate emissions from cars, which in the practical scheme of things is really not that big a deal. It would be if Congress hadn't passed that stupid law mandating an increase in fuel economy to 35 miles a gallon. But because they did it, uh, very likely EPA would only have to tweak that a little bit if EPA were only regulating under this Section 202, which deals just with motor vehicles, that's what, the, that's what Massachusetts versus EPA was, was ostensibly about and only about, this one provision of the Clean Air Act. However, the Clean Air Act, as my friend Ben Lieberman likes to say, is a model of redundancy. And once you start regulating something under one provision, it turns out you have to regulate it under others. Um, one of these provisions is, uh, is called Prevention of Significant Deterioration. It's Section 165 of the uh, Clean Air Act. And this is, this is a pre-construction permitting program for stationary sources like this building here. So if we begin to regulate CO2 from motor vehicles, EPA is going to have to regulate CO2 from facilities like the sky room that, that, we're, that we're in right now. And uh, what this provision says is that you cannot build a major stationary source of a pollutant subject to regulation unless you get one of these permits, nor can you modify, renovate that source, which could be this building here, if there is any increase in emissions resulting from that. Well, if you were to add a few more rooms onto a hotel, that would do it, unless you get one of these permits. Now, what's the problem with that? Well. A major source is defined for this particular program uh, that the, of the Clean Air Act uh, as one in 28 listed categories that emits 100 tons of the regulated pollutant a year, or if you're anybody else, 250 tons. Now, 250 tons may be a reasonable threshold for defining a major source when you're dealing with emissions that produce smog or soot. But when you're talking about carbon dioxide, it is a minuscule amount. It's roughly the amount that's emitted by two dozen average homes. And so uh, we could get literally hundreds of thousands of previously unregulated entities in this country all of a sudden categorized as major stationary sources for purposes of this pre-construction permitting program. And this would include buildings of 100,000 square feet if they're heated by fossil fuels. So the very hotel that we're in, it would even include a commercial kitchen, like if you're, you know, a pizza, a, a California pizza kitchen restaurant, if they use natural gas. <coughs> Thanks. <coughs> now, the thing is that none of these types of sources have ever been subject to these P PSD permitting requirements before because they emit so little of the traditional air pollutants, the ones that cause so, uh, smog and soot. But now they would all be swept into the PSD program. And this is an amazing regulatory burden. <clears throat> These permits can take years to obtain. They can cost hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, just the paperwork, and that's just the beginning. <coughs> Excuse me. Because if to get a permit, you have to install what's called best available control technology. Nobody even knows what that is for CO2 yet. And uh, 
And if you just look at the paperwork burdens alone, here's a quote from uh, two experts who testified on this uh, before the House, <coughs> before the uh, House Government Oversight Committee, no small business requiring a moderate-sized building or facility heated with fossil fuel could operate subject to the PSD administrative burden. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, I'm having a tickle that I didn't anticipate. <coughs> All right, and then, okay, so now also what would happen is you'd put all, all kinds of businesses in this country under a, a cloud of regulatory limbo. You know, you, we often hear build businesses saying in the climate debate, what we need is regulatory certainty. Well, nobody knows what best available control technology for carbon dioxide means uh, in order to, for the states actually uh, enforce the PSD program for the most part. And so states would first have to have one of, a process which would take years to, de to, to uh, develop and approve state implementation plans with new best available control technology uh, requirements. And basically, we would create an environment of uncertainty that could be uh, considerable, perhaps fatal for, for businesses. But that's just the beginning, because, then, because once we actually had the PSD requirements in place at the state level, and as approved by the EPA, we would in enter a phase of regulatory hell. Um, and uh, one reason is that once you're classified as a major source for regulatory purposes under this PSD program, it's not only for the pollutant that you were initially regulated for, but for all other pollutants that are regulated under the act. So all of a sudden, uh, these little uh, mom and pop enterprises, uh, or just you know otherwise innocuous and innocent structures like this building, would need to get permits for uh, for not only uh, uh, CO2 but NOx, PM, lead, mercury, SO2. This regulatory burden is so enormous that, uh, according to the Chamber of Commerce's uh, es estimation, it would literally stop. Um, uh, most construction activity in this country. It would bring it to a screeching halt. Now, this is just one consequence of an endangerment finding uh, uh, under uh, pursuant to the Supreme Court case of Mass versus EPA. Another is that EPA would probably be litigated to start a national ambient air quality standard rulemaking for carbon dioxide because the endangerment test language in Section 202, which deals only with motor vehicles, is the same as the endangerment language test, which you find in Section 108 of the Clean Air Act, which uh, is the cornerstone of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards Program. Now, when you think about this, this is truly mind-boggling. Uh, a National Ambient Air Quality Standard says there may be this many parts per million of the regulated pollutant in the air and no more. Okay. Now, the plaintiffs in Massachusetts versus EPA said that current levels of carbon dioxide are harming public health and welfare today. So the logic of this would be that we would have to set the national ambient air quality standard lower than today's carbon dioxide levels. Well, I think as we all know, the Kyoto Protocol would only barely slow the increase in carbon dioxide levels. It, at, at a minimum, you would need to deindustrialize America to bring America into attainment with a carbon dioxide national ambient air quality standard if it were set lower than today's uh, CO2 levels. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I just want to uh, I just want to point out a few things here. Uh, the court did not tell EPA it had to make an endangerment finding. It told EPA. You can make one or you cannot, but whatever you do, you have to ground your action in the statute. And here are some statutory reasons why I think EPA should not do this. Uh, one is that Congress never intended for this provision that deals solely with motor vehicle emissions to instigate a massive expansion of stationary source regulation. That would be a consequence of an endangerment finding, but certainly nothing that Congress ever intended nor anything that Congress would vote for if it were put into a bill and presented. Similarly, uh, uh, <clears throat> Congress never intended for this provision to trigger 
uh, a, 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 an administratively crippling paperwork burden for EPA and its state counterparts because the state agencies that enforce the PSD program would be literally inundated with permit applications. It would, it would, it, I mean, it might actually shut them down. Some of you might think that would be a good thing, but this is a, this is an argument that could be uh, used in talking to environmentalists. Do you really want to cripple environmental enforcement in this country? Well, then go ahead, push EPA to make an endangerment fine because once that happens, the EPA and its state counterparts won't have any time to do anything else except process paperwork. Um, similarly, here, here's something that's, uh, that I think is very striking. Section 202 of the Clean Air Act, which was the, the section under which Massachusetts EPA was litigated, is one of those sections of the Clean Air Act which says that EPA actually has to take costs into account. It just can't it just can't look to what it thinks is the ideal health-based standard. It has to consider compliance costs, technical feasi technological feasibility. And yet, if this becomes the predicate for a national ambient air quality standard rulemaking, then EPA must regulate as if money is no object. Again, even deindustrialization might not be too much uh, to ask of the American people uh, under the National Ambient Air Quality Standards if that's what it takes to bring America into attainment. Um, now, uh, nobody knows at this point what EPA is going to do. I'll tell you what I think we ought to be doing. We, we need to talk this up. Uh, everybody is so focused, and the media is so focused on the big climate bills and the debate over them or the debate over Kyoto and, its, and the Kyoto negotiations uh, that most people don't see this threat coming from left field at them. So, uh, so we, we, need to, we need to wake people up about that. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, and uh, now, one other, uh, uh, so what, what's the ultimate solution to this? Well, one would be uh, legislation that makes clear that Massachusetts EPA, whatever EPA does in relation to Massachusetts EPA, only applies to Section 202 which is the provision under which it was litigated and which plaintiffs promised was the only thing they were considering. Uh, so that whatever decision EPA makes there will not affect the regulatory status of carbon dioxide or any other greenhouse gas emission under uh, a greenhouse gas under any other provision of the act. And f my final uh, message to you is beware of policy terrorism because the real game plan here, I think, I, this is just me drawing in reasonable inferences from the situation, is that the, the plaintiffs in Massachusetts EPA and the environmental litigants who love this stuff, what they want to do is put us between a rock and a hard place in which the only choices we have are a cap and trade bill that includes a legislative fix or what I called PSD hell and deindustrialization under the NACS program. They want to say, okay, we agree with you that this is not a good way to regulate carbon dioxide, but the only, the only way out is a cap-and-trade bill that preempts further regulation under the Clean Air Act, okay? And I think we have to call that what it is. It's the legislative equivalent of hijacking and hostage-taking. It's policy terrorism. And we should tell them that, uh, that, that, <clears throat> that we should not be put in a position where people say to us, we will let EPA blow up your economy unless you support our cap and trade bill. PSD hell should be rejected on its own merits and cap and trade bills should stand and fall on their own merits, but uh, PSD hell should not be used to terrorize us into supporting legislation that should be rejected on the merits. Thank you very much.